Lord reveals a call gradually and over time. Like any relationship, you have to put time and effort into it. And certainly in the relationship with God, it requires us to respond to the grace he's already giving. So he's making the first step towards us. God is ever faithful even when we are not so. Too many people might think it's like uh, the voice behind a curtain, a bit like uh, in some of those old Hollywood movies with Charlton Heston and uh, somehow there will be uh, a very distinct uh, instruction given to you at a very specific moment, almost like a, a lightning bolt, even if it's whispered uh, to you. I think it often happens that God reveals a call gradually and over time. Like any relationship, you have to put time and effort into it. And certainly in the relationship with God, it requires us to respond to the grace he's already giving. So he's making the first step towards us. Loving God with all your heart is therefore like a rhythm of breath or of the beating of the heart. And in that way, you're just maintaining constant contact. Loving God with all your heart isn't just contained within God's house, the church, when we visit him in the Blessed Sacrament, though it helps to be there often. My name is Father Ninian Duhan, and I am a priest at St Patrick's on the Cowgate here in Edinburgh, in the Archdiocese of St Andrews in Edinburgh. I'm a priest of the Diocese of Dunkeld, but discerning with another priest from the Diocese of Arundel and Brighton the possibility of establishing the Oratory of St Philip Neri in Scotland for the first time. Not only do I serve the parish of St Patrick's, but I'm also serving the Royal Infirmary and the Children's Hospital here in Edinburgh. And so that's a continuation of my work as a hospital chaplain previously in Dundee. So I was born in the Royal Borough of Rutherglen <laughs> and only because that's where the maternity hospital was for the south side of Glasgow. So I was baptised in St Margaret Mary's Castle Milk, um, which is a, a large scheme, uh, post-war scheme, housing scheme, uh, created after the Second World War. Uh, my family uh, all come from Glasgow itself, though we have both uh, Scots and Irish roots, but everybody was born um, here, uh, well, in Glasgow, and uh, then when you go the next generation back, my great-grandparents, then there's a, a diversity. It, my mother and father, they married young, and um, uh, although they were very happy to receive me, obviously, um, uh, you know, I think it's about 18 months after, after the wedding or so, um, uh, family life wasn't easy at the start, and um, it became very evident very quickly that uh, my mother, although she, she knew my father well, um, sadly that he was already, at a very young age, um, both an alcoholic and a drug addict. And this meant that eventually, after a number of attempts and seeking counsel and advice and what she should do, then she had to flee the house, flee the home. And from that moment onwards, of course, uh, divorce would follow a number of years later, um, but they would be separated. And so I grew up uh, in, in a house where uh, my mother would give permission for me to visit my father but because of the circumstances as you can imagine with anyone who has the sadness of disease of addiction that it was always in the company of my uh, my grandparents who live very close by uh, to him in fact so I then grew up in another part of the south side of Glasgow but closer to the River Clyde um, the great River Clyde which is famous for shipbuilding and, uh, and great industry um, by the time I was born, I was born in 1981, was uh, sadly uh, a time of economic downturn and depression. And um, yet there was a, a place of great change. The area was called Kenning Park. So the parish was called Our Lady and St Margaret's and there I made my other sacraments. Um, obviously my first confession and uh, first Holy Communion. 
and I was confirmed. Uh, this parish was a great parish in the 19th century, but sadly uh, would close at the end of the 20th century. And changes in demographics um, uh, made it so that the Catholic population was very small. But I grew up, if you like, in a very intense Catholic enclave in the middle of what was quite a Protestant area, but also an area which was um, occupied by many new migrants from Pakistan. And uh, so there was this uh, great history and heritage of uh, Highland Scots Catholics and Donegal Ulster Catholics um, being together, um, very close to the city centre actually. So I was taken to Mass every Sunday by my mum at uh, Our Lady in St Margaret's, but uh, usually every second Sunday I would be uh, given over to my uh, paternal grandparents and um, then I would go back to the church where I was baptised at Margaret Mary's and uh, between these two churches there grew within me uh, uh, the awareness of God that um, you know his presence was within me but ultimately especially in his house uh, in the tabernacle and the aspiration um, uh, to, like everybody else, uh, receive him in the Blessed Sacrament and became very strong. I had an excellent uh, catechesis. Uh, our headmistress at school, Miss Winifred Macaulay, um, was very, uh, well, let's just be honest, she was very strict and very adamant about um, the good catechesis that we should all receive and that that should um, translate into um, uh, excellence in the practice of the faith. But of course there were also challenges, which was that not everybody in the family practised and even as a child uh, you begin to question and ask why this is the case and so you become aware that um, to live for God is a choice. When I was 12 we moved to Australia and I remember most certainly by the time I'd started um, secondary school at Cardine College in uh, the southern part, southern beaches of Adelaide, I would go to daily mass and um, the priest was very kind, uh, the fact that he then told the headmaster that I was at mass so I was excused from roll call because I would just be a little bit late. I was also dismissed after receiving Holy Communion to make sure that I would then be on time for the first class. You know this intimacy with Jesus around the altar um, uh, was very was, was unique, uh, you know, I was used to being in church almost, uh, uh, not distant, but you know, as a child uh, taken. Now I, I was there willingly, you know, at, at daily mass. And of course, you eventually find that the Lord is, is, is presenting to you the idea of the sacred as, as something which is within your grasp, that this invisible world is made visible through his holy church. And the greatness of the universe and the cosmos is contained um, uh, with him. And therefore, I suppose all the, the limits of my young mind were, um, were expanded um, uh, through holy religion and, and the practice of it. And so uh, as I grew, uh, there was ov obviously in the teenage years, there are gaps that begin to appear. And in some senses, when I look back on it now, obviously there's a great sadness when I allowed those gaps to become bigger because the Lord was forever walking with me and, and making my experiences um, intense and memorable. And sometimes I turned away from him. But eventually um, he has his way and um, uh, that great foundation that is given to you, you can return a bit like the prodigal son, return to the father's house and the welcome uh, is greater than, uh, than you remember uh, the departure bringing sorrow to you. It must have been about the year 2002 that uh, the vocation to the priesthood uh, had to be answered. It was a, uh, an impetus within me that you know I could no longer uh, ignore. And I remember being at Holy Mass with the Blessed Sacrament Fathers on George Street in Sydney. And um, a very old uh, father, uh, he said during his daily sermon, he said, um, perhaps today there is somebody here present uh, that is called by God to be a priest. They just need to say yes. And of course, I looked around me and there was, there was not a single man there apart from myself and there were many pious old ladies. I learned later that that priest is, is quite short-sighted and, and couldn't have seen whether I was there or not. He was just speaking in general, hoping that um, his invitation would be heard. I went to speak to my parish priest, who was a Scalabrini father um, from Italy, from Venice. And um, he was very keen to hear my story, but he was even 
he was even prouder that I was the solution to some of his problems. He needed me to teach English to uh, a missionary from Colombia who had just arrived because his English was insufficient to, to say the daily mass. So I had to get up at six o'clock in the morning in order to have an hour's worth of English class before we then had uh, mass and I had to guide him through the mass even in that way. I then in my parish uh, found myself doing lots of things I hadn't done before like um, counting the weekly collection or helping um, clear up uh, their library, doing apostolic work, going on um, house visitations, all in the very inner city of Sydney, often to migrants who didn't have any English and, um, and often with priests whose English is quite broken so almost being like a translator um, uh, for Italians or, or, or Spanish or, um, or for new migrants from Southeast Asia. Um, so all of these things uh, started to grow and, and the missions of charity were very important to me. They were just down the road and after early morning mass I would go and I would help out at their soup kitchen and I remember that they were giving me confidence to you know, read a little bit of scripture uh, with those who came for breakfast and then to give a little sort of uh, homily on that and uh, you learnt in the rough and tumble of those who were homeless or um, those who uh, not just homeless, but were in deeply dangerous situations on the street. You you learned the great finesse of, of loving them and also about um, how not to be overly pious in situations that required you to be exceptionally prudential. All of this was uh, the way in which that God was then forming me to, to answer that uh, call most definitively. And at the time I was also reading um, what Pope John Paul II was calling the world to, which is to re-christianize Christendom. And you know, although I'd lived in Australia for 10 years at that point, I always felt this longing for my homeland and really the idea of answering uh, the call to the priesthood in Scotland, uh, that came, it came to the fore. I suppose I was also unsure about, uh, I was ignorant actually about uh, priestly formation and yet I was more sure that perhaps that could happen um, back home than, than in New South Wales. When I reflect on it, I probably should have asked uh, for greater advice. Uh, especially of the local clergy because as I've just mentioned a lot of them were missionaries or people who weren't native to that place to find myself at a point where I could undertake the academic studies but where? So I did apply for the uh, seminary applicants year for Scotland through the Archdiocese of Glasgow and yet even within the first few meetings there seemed to be something missing in my vocation uh, or my inquiry and community life, I'd went to a former Christian Brothers school, community life uh, came to the fore. Scotland before the Reformation had been predominantly served by canons regular of St Augustine. Uh, Augustinian priories are all over the country and uh, my great love of history took me to these uh, romantic places like on the Lake of Menteith where there's an Augustinian priory that Robert de Bruce and also Mary Queen of Scots also uh, had a, uh, a few nights on. But I really thought about the fact that in the priesthood, it would be um, surely to my great advantage to share fraternally the sacred priesthood with other men equally called. And that's what those Augustinians did. They had one foot in the pastoral world and one foot in the, if you like, the cloistered contemplative community life. And where was that to be found? Well, inexplicably, one of the invitations was found, I suppose, by looking at the internet. And then all of a sudden one day there was the Canons Regular of Premontre, who are also a type of Augustinians, Norbertines. There was an invitation that just said, come and see, with an address to write to Sussex or to write to Manchester. And of course, I'd come back from Australia with the idea of serving God in Scotland. So the idea of going in way to the south of England, that I wasn't even going to entertain that. So I wrote to Manchester, and so that was closer. And I suppose uh, Lancashire sounds about like Lanarkshire. And uh, anyway, with that type of simplicity, I got a letter back that just said, here are some available dates, contact us. And then I found myself uh, on a train later and for the first time in Manchester and at the Basilica of Corpus Christi in a very poor area called Miles Platting, which has now been regenerated, but not in my own time, in the splendor of the sacred liturgy, but also in serving what was the poorest of the poor, to be honest, um, uh, in inner city Manchester, I felt at home immediately. And really my, my soul expanded, my heart was filled with joy, and uh, I, I visited over and over and over again. Though I still kept on going to the weekend sessions for the seminary applicants here for Scotland, I asked permission from my spiritual director at the time, who was the parish priest of um, St uh, Bartholomew's uh, in Castlemilk, and, you know, eventually I knew a decision had to be made. And so I applied for the Norbertines, I was accepted as a postulant. That would be, I suppose, uh, by spring 2004 and by uh, 
uh, August 2004, I started a very brief postulancy, just a fortnight, before I was clothed in the white habit of St Norbert on the first Vespers of St Augustine, 27th of August that year. And I was joined by another man in the novitiate and a small group um, who were forming a new community on an old foundation because the Norbertines had been in Manchester, I think it was since 1889, and there was a wonderful basilica there. Um, I might get my dates wrong now, but I think it's 1903, um, which is sadly now closed. But uh, I spent three wonderful years there, not without trials and difficulties, but eventually that community closed, they moved location, and with that move, if you like, my original phase of formation and guidance of vocation also had to move. I spent some time in Ireland, um, in between cloisters, and I almost felt that I was called perhaps to be more contemplative in my vocation. So I wrote to a few Cistercian uh, monasteries, a Benedictine, and I even visited the Carthusians for 30 days at Parkminster. And I really wanted to be a Carthusian, and this might surprise people, I can actually keep silence. <laughs> um, I think if it's a discipline, then I can do it, but otherwise I can talk for Scotland. Um, all of those places, they fed my vocation, but confirmed within me that I was called to serve God in the act of apostolate. And so I returned to the Norbertines at the mother house, the foundation house of Manchester, which was an abbey called Our Lady's Abbey of Tongaro in uh, the northern part of Belgium, uh, called Flanders, but in the province of Antwerp. And uh, there I rejoined the order and I was there for another seven years. And that's where principally my priestly formation came to its conclusion. I was ordained to the diaconate there after solemn profession by the Lord Bishop of uh, um, Hasselt, which is in Limburg, a very Marian bishop, I asked uh, specifically um, uh, for him because I was, uh, I was ordained a deacon on the, the birthday of Our Lady, the 8th of September. Our, Our Lady has always accompanied me um, throughout my vocation and it was wonderful that her nativity would be chosen uh, in the way that I would now be changed forever. Yes, as a religious, but um, uh, more specifically um, uh, on, that, on that royal road to priesthood. My ordination in St Andrew's Cathedral was just so beautiful. Um, it was even outside, there were fireworks going off. I don't know what it was for, it wasn't organised by me. Um, but with great gratitude um, to all those who made that day possible. And by that, I don't just mean the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin, I mean for all those who have contributed up until that time, I was, uh, was I, yeah, 34 years old, about to turn 35 a week later. For all the, those who made that possible, uh, you know, my heart was filled to bursting. And the celebrations afterwards, um, after Holy Mass, the first time, of course, um, uh, consecrating along with the Bishop, uh, the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And then the imparting of my first priestly blessings, which just went on and on and on. The altar rail at St Andrews just seemed to be um, without end. And the hundreds of people who were there and, and who received that, I made a very specific point. After imposing that blessing upon them, I whispered in their ear something very specific, inspired by another priest, I think it was Father Kevin Dow, who said to me, you know, ask the people to pray for you in a particular way. And so I asked them to pray for things like, pray that I may always love the poor, and pray that I may be faithful to celibacy and holy chastity, um, I pray that I may be a good confessor, I pray that I may devote myself to schools and children. Anything that came to my mind, sometimes inspired by the person themselves, but sometimes not. And years later, I have people that say, do you know, I keep on praying that you love the poor, Father. You know, that faithfulness in them is just an example uh, of God's fidelity to me answering that call. Um, my first Mass the next day in the parish church of St Mary's in Lochie. Again, the splendour of the liturgy, the uh, Academy of Sacred Music was present um, uh, for Scotland and uh, the, the expression of the love of God um, uh, almost breaking open the, the rafters. Uh, I knew that God would be forever, since I'm again changed ontologically, would be forever faithful, even to me as a sinner, as a priest sinner now. Um, and 
ultimately, it would be my comfort to know that he is present within me. Upon these hands, um, the oil has been anointed for the means of which to forgive sins or to make him present upon the altar, um, to be a co-sanctifier with him. Cardinal Newman has, St John Henry Newman has some phrase, I forget exactly the, the precise nature of it now, which is, blessed are those who give themselves to God in the flower of their youth. You know, at 21 I thought I was going to be ordained quickly because of the shortage of priests. <laughs> Thanks be to God that didn't happen. I saw at my ordination, therefore, all the great years of grace, um, every 12 months of blessing, his perpetual presence guiding and directing. And I could only imagine that from ordination onwards that that, that experience, that example uh, would continue and would never dissipate. And therefore, um, well, I'm here today, uh, yes, seven years a priest now, if you like. It wouldn't have mattered if it was only seven days that I had been a priest. Um, it, the length of time is important in the sense of what God asks us to do, but it is, I suppose, the uh, mentality of the Spirit, which is staying close to His fidelity. That has to be at the principal part of my priesthood. And I suppose when I look in the morning when I'm shaving, <laughs> I have to really, like all of us do, I can't take that for granted. I need to cooperate um, with that which he gives. I find myself now a priest at St. Patrick's on the Cowgate in the very centre of the old town of Edinburgh, which is in the Archdiocese of St. Andrews and Edinburgh. And I serve God through this parish, in this archdiocese, in this city, um, but also in its hospitals as well. I also serve God now through the Edinburgh Oratory Project, um, together with Father Gerard Hatton, who is a priest of the Diocese of Arundel Brighton, um, at the invitation of uh, the Archbishop, Leo Cushley, also at our desire, um, writing to the oratory at York to bring the oratory of St Philip Neri to Scotland for the first time and since it happened just a wee while ago it was in the 175th anniversary year of the foundation of the oratory in England by now St John Henry Newman at Maryville uh, outside Birmingham. Uh, I serve God again in community, a community of priests. Admittedly only two of us but we hope that God will send us vocations. What I love the most about being a priest is being in the confessional, in the sacrament of penance, the sacrament of reconciliation. And it's the possibility there of bringing forgiveness, absolution to the past, peace in the present moment, and hope for the future to each individual soul, which gives me the greatest inspiration in my own perseverance as a priest. It's such a wonderful gift to be able to restore to full friendship those who have fallen away in small or even great things with their God. Jesus, you called chosen men to be with you, to preach the good news of salvation, and to have authority over the powers of darkness. Send your Holy Spirit upon the men you have chosen for the priestly ministry. May they answer your call and follow you with generous hearts. Amen. <laughs>